Originally, this video was going to cover the entire U.S. military's PASGET system, which comprises of the Kevlar helmet and vest. However, due to the somewhat split histories of the two, this will be made into a two-part series to give both pieces direct focus and prevent any confusion. The PASGET system helped bring in a new era of safety and protection for forces, not only in the United States military, but around the world as well. Though the body armor itself helped many troops, the helmet would become one of the most recognizable and widely used Kevlar helmets on the world stage, spawning multiple clones throughout various countries. So without any more delay, let's delve into the history of the Pazget helmet. Shortly after the United States withdrew from Vietnam, various military agencies led by the U.S. Army NATEC Development Center set a goal to create new and improved body armor and helmet systems that would be safer and easier to wear. Up until this point, both Marines and soldiers were issued the M1 steel helmet, the same helmet, minus a few tweaks here and there, used since the U.S. entered World War II in 1941. Research and designing for the new helmet system began in 1973 and covered things like the general shape of the helmet, a new retention system, vision, maximum area of protection, and various others. Throughout the testing, numerous helmet prototypes were made which boasted various camouflage paint schemes on them, in addition to the standard olive green. This was done to market to the Army. The final version of the helmet was never intended to include a camouflage pattern painted on it. In early 1976, after a few years of trial and error, two patents were filed and the final version of the helmet was reached. Phase two of testing then began in May of 1976. During this time, new ballistic material would be tested with the finalized shape. Two versions of the helmet were developed. One was made of glass reinforced plastic, or GRP, and the other was made up of Kevlar 29, later known as Aramid. 200 pieces were made for each version. These pieces would be first tested for compatibility, durability, operations, and in Arctic temperatures. Then, shortly after, they would undergo ballistic tests. The GRP and Kevlar provided nearly identical ballistic protection, but the Kevlar proved to be a bit more durable. So Kevlar was chosen, which consisted of 19 layers of aramid bonded together with a synthetic polymer resin. The nomenclature PASGET, which stood for Personal Armor System for Ground Troops, was then officially given for the completed helmet and vest on June 26, 1978. Because of its shape, these helmets have often been compared to the German Stahlhelms, specifically the M35, seen throughout World War II. They feature a front visor as well as protection for the ears and neck. This would soon lead many to refer to them as the Fritz helmet. Though that's often the belief, the Pazgat helmet was not based on the design of the M35, but rather the creators used a similar method the Germans did of researching the human body and taking into account specific areas to protect. Other nicknames included the K-Pot, or simply the Kevlar helmet. On the inside, the suspension and chin strap systems were given an overhaul as well. Based on the older Riddle system, the suspension webbing was attached by six screws and A-nuts directly to the helmet, getting rid of the old fiberglass liners. A small leather headband was then clipped around the suspension system. This helped with fitting as well as keeping the wearer cool. As for the chin strap, it was attached by two screws on either side, had a snap button on one side for quick removal, and had two pull straps for easy adjustment. You can find a link to the manual for the helmet in the description below. The final design for the helmet was approved in 1978 with full development beginning in 1980. Both the Pazgat vest and helmet were first seen in 1983 during the U.S. intervention in Grenada during Operation Urgent Fury. It would then become standard issue in 1985 with the complete transition finishing sometime in 1988. These new Kevlar helmets came in five different sizes, extra small, small, medium, large, and extra large though this wasn't the original case. Initially, a team from Natick Labs had determined that small, medium, and large would be sufficient for just about every male wearer. However, because of pressure from Congress, extra small was added to accommodate female troops. Extra large was then added in 1989 to accommodate the needs of a single senior army official. All of these sizes were a welcome change for troops, who had up until this point had to deal with the M1's one-size-fits-all. So with all this work, you may be wondering what the National Institute of Justice's, or NIJ, armor protection rating is. Well, here's where the helmet falls. Because of its thickness and structure, the rating was 3A, able to stop 357 SIG and 44 Magnum calibers fired from long-barreled handguns. 
The Pasgat system would be seen on a massive scale during the Gulf War. It was here that the six color chocolate chip covers were first seen being worn by troops. These covers generally came in two sizes, extra small, small, and medium, large. Though other sizes have popped up, such as just medium and extra large. They were attached by sliding the chin straps through the two holes along the bottom, and then looping the nylon straps around behind the sweatband and attaching it via the Velcro ends. Many of these covers would see either claw or pin rank insignia on the front. Finally, these covers were then capped off with either a green or tan elastic band that had two IR tabs on its back and may include the wearer's last name and or blood type. These would quickly gain the popular nickname of cat's eye bands. As time progressed, troops may have been issued apart from the standard M81 Woodland helmet cover a three-color desert cover, a solid white snow cover, and a green NBC, or nuclear biological chemical, rubber cover. A cover was even made for the Marine Corps during Operation Urban Warrior that had the experimental urban mount camo on it. Two major add-on items for this helmet were a mount for the front used for numerous night vision goggles and a protective riot face visor. These helmets were also modified to accommodate requirements for paratroopers. After a few training accidents and deaths because of the two-point chin strap system, a lightweight version of the helmet was created. This version also included a rear protective impact pad and retention strap, turning the two-point chin strap into a three-point one. This allowed a safer bump area in the back, as well as a strap to help keep the helmet from coming loose and falling off. Towards the mid to late 1990s, changes were beginning to happen to the Pasgat system. Troops began complaining that the helmet was too loose and would fall forwards or backwards after long durations of wear, and that the suspension system itself was outdated and uncomfortable. Not only that, but the front grim also made using night vision goggles hard for troops, as it was further away from the face. As a stopgap measure, forces began to be issued a foam insert which was added, allowing for better cushioning. In 2001, the U.S. Army replaced the Pasgat helmet with the Mitch helmet. Then, in 2003, the Marine Corps introduced its own helmet, simply called the Lightweight Helmet. Though the Lightweight Helmet is very similar in shape and color, its chin strap system and introduction of padding, not to mention upgraded protection capability, vastly surpassed the Pasgat helmets. This left the U.S. Navy, which as of 2017 still uses Hasgat helmets for its sailors stationed aboard ships. Although only one branch of the U.S. military today still officially uses this helmet, it is still used on a grand scale around the world. Though the list is rather long, some notable ones are the Mexican military, the Greek Hellenic Army, the Portuguese Army, the Saudi Arabian Army and National Guard, and the Republic of China's military in Taiwan. This does not include the numerous clones and copies out there, which range from the Japanese Type 88 helmet, the French Spectra helmet, and the Chinese NDH-2001 helmet, to name a few. And with that, we've reached the end of another video. Information and records for various stages of the Kevlar helmet's life are quite bountiful, and as a result, bits were cut for time's sake. So be sure to keep an eye out for the supplementary video, where we will be diving into various other prototypes and variants seen during the testing phases, as well as variations on helmet pieces. Remember to subscribe or check back in the future for the second part in our Pazgit series, in which we will be looking into the protective vest, also known by some as the Pazgit Flak Vest.